Now, welcome to this, the first part of the FSC Workplace Savings Introduction to Good Governance for Workplace Savings Schemes. It's the uh, third element in this introductory series. Um, my name is Tim McGuinness. I have been a professional trustee director for over 16 years or so now, and a licensed independent trustee for the last five since the introduction of that regime around 2015. I'm involved with a number of restricted schemes. I'm currently chair of the Dairy Industry Super Fund and uh, the licensed independent trustee of the Westpac Staff Super and the New Zealand Aluminium Multi Retirement Fund. Uh, before that, I was a trustee of the director of the police and fire service schemes, among others. Um, I'll be sharing this presentation with Brian Connor. So I will get Brian to introduce himself uh, to you now. Thank you, Tim. So my name is uh, Brian Connor, and my background is in corporate trustee services. So uh, early in my career, I spent some 20 years in the personal client services space, but uh, the latter part of my career, I moved on to corporate trustee services and uh, was involved in that sector for some 46 years. Uh, I still retain an interest in the corporate trustee sector. I'm a director of two uh, relatively large corporate trustee companies. And like Tim, uh, I gained a license to be a licensed independent trustee in 2015. And uh, I currently act as the licensed independent trustee for 12 schemes, but they're on the sort of a smaller scale compared to Tim. Uh, but they certainly keep me busy. Thank you. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a couple of quotes. Um, and the first quote is a bit of a, a why there was all this focus on governance. And it, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day whether you're a large listed company or a small restrictor scheme. It is well documented and recognised um, that good governance does matter. And a well-functioning trustee board, just as a well-functioning board in any environment, is a key necessary element for, for success. Um, for a restrictive scheme, you obviously need good investment, so you need a good administration, communication, finance, and all those are all sorted. Uh, but the glue that brings it all together is the governance framework of the trustee board. And in the first quote, the key words that I look at are, are um, dedicated and competent. And um, I hope a lot of what we do today will, will focus a bit on, um, from an individual director or trustee's point of view, what that looks like. Um, the second quote is, is the base of all things governance really and encompasses what might be a good trustee governor's uh, mantra. You know, you know, take responsibility, which, which means basically recognize you're at the top of the tree, uh, top of the structure. Be accountable, which is sort of delegate appropriately, but at the end of the day, uh, the buck stops with you. Um, act fairly, which is all about being even handed and fair in your dealings and be transparent on what you do. You know, communicate, inform, be open. And um, as the quote from the Director's um, Institute sort of says, um, that doesn't matter how you define governance, um, those elements sort of sit in all of them um, and um, are, are important to be followed. Um, so thinking about how we're going to actually um, deal with this today, uh, moving on to the next slide. We thought we'd just run through the overview of the presentation. Um, we're first of all going to cover off a, a bit of an overview of the usual governance structure seen in the sector, um, how they're set out about in practice, and um, how they sort of the composition of them forms over time. Um, and in the second part of the presentation today, we'll deal with the expectations for the behaviour of individual trustees or directors. Um, what we see is some of the key elements of, or traits of, for effective governance, um, but also some of those that are sort of slightly or potentially quite ineffective um, and to be avoided if possible. Um, part two of our structure that will follow this presentation will be uh, more of a collective look at um, the directors working together. We will base it around the financial market authorities' expectations in respect of conduct and culture, you know, quite a common topic these days. And, and the things that should underpin trustee director good group behavior and actions. 
and we'll explore that in a bit more depth, um, examining the sort of things that the governing fiduciaries as a group should do for their scheme. So um, <clears throat> looking at um, the slides on governance structures. Um, now, workplace savings schemes, first off, are, are treated a bit differently under the Financial Markets Conduct Authority, uh, Financial Markets Conduct Act, compared to most managed investment schemes. The more usual model you'll see in the marketplace requires a separate manager from a separate supervisor from a separate custodian. This required for most managed schemes, but doesn't really, was never really going to work for employer based uh, workplace savings schemes. Uh, to recognise this, uh, workplace saving schemes are set up to not need a separate manager or supervisor. You know, for example, with the supervision now being done directly by the FMA. So what we have is a, is a trustee or trustees as the primary party for the restrictor scheme. So a trustee, but also effectively being the manager or being regarded as a manager under the, the Act. Um, now, there are some technical differences between... Um, the ways trustees may set themselves up. Um, the two sort of common models in our market or our sector is um, a separate single purpose trustee company where, um, where there's a board of appointed directors. The alternative and if you like older style model is to have a trust, have a group or collective of trustees individually, uh, which might be supported by a nominee company below that for holding assets and so forth. Both are, are fine and both are appropriate and depending on circumstance. Um, but for this exercise, you know, you have a trustee individual on one side or a company director on the other. We're going to basically treat that as largely the same for this discussion because the actions inside the boardroom are all, for all intents and purposes, the same. You know, you things you will do on behalf of members um, in either setting in terms of good governance is largely going to be the same. So we will, we will just treat those as interchangeable. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to the second part of the structure slide. Um, the, now, the most schemes now have a mix of different trustees or different directs that have come from different sources. Um, each has a role to play and each will have different skills and sets to bring to the table. The key characteristics for the ones we just wanted to highlight are, are the, obviously the first ones are those that are sourced through the sponsor and the members. And often that's defined in the deed as to how they are sourced, whether they're voted on by members, appointed by the sponsor, employer, or whatever. Um, they're often not expert. It's not their day job normally to be trustees or directors of, of managed investment schemes. Uh, but they bring the perspective of having a very close association with the membership and the sponsor, which is really important to maintain throughout um, the scheme's activities. Um, prior to the um, advent of the Financial Markets Conduct Act, um, it was acknowledged by many schemes, particularly some of the larger ones, that, that it was very valuable to have some professional skills around the table in addition to the, the in-house um, trustee directors. And many of them therefore appointed one or more uh, professional directors to their, to their mix, bringing specialist skills or professional knowledge in a particular area that the directors wanted to uh, benefit from. Now, the third element that came in in 2015 approximately with the Financial Markets Conduct Act was the requirement that every restrictor scheme had to have a licensed independent trustee as one of its directors. Um, quite often they were also acting as a professional trustee or director, but um, it's codified under the Act that they needed to have a licensed trustee. And so we'll comment in specifically a little bit about that um, as we go on. So um, probably just before um, I talk about the role of the licensed independent, independent trustee, I might just um, make some other general observations regarding um, directorships and, and restrictive schemes. Um, and we're coming from different sources. Um, as a group, trustees and directors are all in it together um, and they need to work together. And, the, and really there's no um, particular um, weight given to 
legally to one, one director or trustee over another. Now, the legal tests on professional trustees and LITs may be tougher than, um, than, than others, given their expertise and knowledge. And it's very important that if you're appointing them that you do use their professional knowledge and experience. So it's quite appropriate to seek and value their views on issues and give them weight. Um, but it's important to recognize at the end of the day, no one around the table has any greater power in making decisions than anyone else. All directors and trustees are ultimately responsible and all should feel informed enough when key decisions are taken. You've got to be careful um, not to abdicate too much. It's good to be um, to listen and, and take good account of professional advice. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you do need to make your own decisions. So it's important to set that um, up early um, when talking of the various experiences around the table and how trustees can benefit from that. So, so a little bit more about the LIT um, and, and the licensed independent trustee in a bit more detail, just to put them in context, because you will, you will strike them, everyone will strike them somewhere. <laughs> they have to have one on every restrictor scheme. <clears throat> now, every scheme is required under the Financial Markets Conduct Act to have one board member who's nominated by the scheme to fulfill that role, and he's registered with the um, under the with the Financial Markets Authority and on the um, registration for the scheme in, in that purpose. Now, the licensed trustee is to be an independent trustee, uh, independent as defined under the Act, um, and they need to be individually licensed by the Financial Markets Authority to fulfil that role. So there's a defined set of people like Brian and me out there in the marketplace um, who can be called upon to fulfil the role of an independent licensed trustee. Now, as well as the bringing quite often the professional role to um, bear in the trustee, the, the, the LIT has some specific responsibilities and obligations under the Financial Markets Conduct Act um, in that role, in addition to just being the director and trustee as, as, as their day job. And the most notable part of that is to report to the FMA if he or she has reasonable grounds to believe a serious problem has arisen with a relevant scheme. Um, and sort of just sort of building on that a little bit, but the next slide, um, under the Act, what do they call a serious problem? Well, this could include um, things such as um, <clears throat> material contraventions of the issue obligations by the scheme or its trustees, directors. Um, so the you know, scheme will have a number of documents, a number of obligations under the Act and a number of key governing documents, its trustee, its uh, product disclosure statements, other material information, some policies like the statement of investment policy and objectives and others. And, um, and the role of the, of the uh, licensed independent trustee is to ensure that if there's a serious problem or serious contribution with any of those, then they are obliged to report to the financial markets authority as the supervisor of the sector. It might also be that if the board has made a material decision, which the um, trustee believes is not consistent with the trustee, for example, then it would be expected that the uh, licensed immediate trustee would take that up with the Financial Markets Authority and keep them informed. So it's, it's basically a bit like a whistleblower type, um, well, not bit, but it is like a whistleblower type um, role. If the scheme moves to insolvency or financial position becomes inadequate, then there's some reporting obligations and that's relevant at the moment with some defined benefit schemes as valuations and investment markets move around. Um, and then there are a number of other uh, licensing obligations because of managed investment schemes that need to be maintained and similarly contribution of those um, would call on their licensed trustee to report to the regulator. Um, Re-emphasizing, um, this is a statutory role, um, but if you do the first job right, which is to act as a good governor, then hopefully the second role of having a whistleblower obligation should not come into action very often, if at all. Um, and the best thing that a scheme can do with a licensed independent trustee is use their professional trustee or director role fully 
um, to extract the best value out of that role. So that's a bit of an overview of the financial of the licensed independent trustee. Um, and we're just going to sort of start in the next section, talk about um, some of the key elements of what we see of effective individual governance. Um, so what do we do? What's good for all of us to do as individuals around the table to produce a good outcome for members in the restrictive scheme? Now, some boards, um, as part of their good processes, have a documented code of conduct for, for, for trustees or directors. Um, and so what we thought we'd do here is just sort of highlight what might be some of the key behavioural elements you might see in such a statement. And, and, and I guess when you're thinking about individuals around the table, um, here we're talking about the behaviour of really um, sensible people applying themselves diligently and this isn't a slide, I must say, I'm sorry, um, using sound processes um, to make informed decisions within the framework set out in the screen trustee. So that uh, sort of sets the scene. Um, we also got to keep in mind that, that it's highly unlikely that you'll always be right in everything you do. Um, it'd be great if you were, but I haven't struck it yet for myself. And the important thing in whatever you do uh, should be to build on a sound foundation of good behavior, uh, supported by good decision making. And so that's why talking about behavior first, before in this part B, we talk about some of the processes the board might do are good to set the scene. So uh, looking at um, the first sort of section of uh, what we might talk about in terms of good behavior traits. Um, I'm going to cover off um, the area of what we're going to generally call honesty and integrity, sort of ethics, the underlying ethics of trustees and directors. And some of these are no-brainers and pretty obvious. Um, some are worth exploring in a, in a little, just a little depth. Um, this is the bedrock, really, of being a good trustee or director. Um, any good director, the ethics of being a director should be paramount, should be uh, an absolute focus um, in what you do and everything you do. Um, and so the, the first one is sort of non-contentious, really, in terms of acting honestly and in good faith. Um, it, it goes without saying that that, that, that should be the starting, starting frame. It's important... Um, when, when acting, that we, you avoid conflicts of interest. Now, um, sort of be not behave improperly or be placed in situations where a director's honesty and integrity may be questioned. Now, sometimes um, conflicts of interest are obvious. Um, sometimes they're not. And, and, and it could be appearances as much as reality. And I think it's necessary to be clear that um, if it looks odd, from the point of view of conflicts of interest, and it probably is odd, and and you should be conscious of, of, of how you position that. And it's necessary, really, that a board has a robust conflicts of interest process and documentation process. Um, and we will touch on this in part two because it's a key cornerstone to conduct and culture that, that conflicts of interest are managed and managed well. And under the honesty and integrity, it's, it's important that you act lawfully. Now, that's, in a general sense, um, pretty straightforward. But in our setting, you need to know what lawfully means in, your con in our context. And that's why the other sessions, such as um, the introduction to trusteeship with David Ireland and Philip Kalassi, which I encourage you all to, to look at because there's a lot of overlap uh, with ourselves, um, is important to know um, what lawfully means for us. Um, what is the role of it? What are the, what are the main elements that, that that lawfully for a trustee or director actually means? Uh, confidentiality, um, using information for what and who it was intended. Um, it, it's important, you know, you can't know, not know stuff um, when you're sitting around a board table uh, from lots of sources of places. You've got to be conscious, though, about what you then might use it for and how you might disseminate it and making sure that stuff that's confidential to the scheme remains so unless you have clear guidance um, and approval to do otherwise. Um, and that's important. Acting as a fiduciary. Um, 
you know, I think that goes right back to the start, really. We're acting on behalf of others uh, under a trustee with defined rules and just, you know, and, and acting in good faith on behalf of those others. And that's, that's the people that we need to keep right in front of us. Um, it's easier for a restrictive scheme to do that because we are not for profit. We are here to act on behalf of members. Um, so keeping a fiduciary focus um, is, is a lot easier to do than, say, for example, uh, an investment fund, which is retail marketed and all sorts of things. <clears throat> In terms of style, being loyal and supportive of, of the environment and your colleagues is, is, been, is important. Um, it's absolutely necessary that uh, your environment you're in, um, it's got to be challenging and you'll be prepared to challenge and happy to challenge and debate. Um, and you don't have to agree at all times. Um, to do so, um, if everyone says yes to one other person is not a good outcome and not a good process. Um, but there are ways to debate and test and, and, and ways not to, um, to get a good outcome for members. Um, acting positively with the employer um, is important. You know, they are, they are the key sponsor. They are a key stakeholder. They are a key supporter of the environment which is trying to drive good retirement outcomes for their employees. Um, so you've got to be careful about the aspects of your day job leaking into your role as a trustee or director of the scheme. Uh, when you come in the room, you are a director trustee. So you're just going to be, be careful about extraneous stuff outside um, and, and keeping a focus on being positive in terms of all stakeholders, both the members as primary, but also the employer as a key stakeholder sponsor. And the last element under the Sondersy and Integrity section that I want to touch on is, is something that's come to the fore really with the Financial Markets Conduct Act, but it happened with before as well. Um, and it's the role of the lit as much as the role of others. That, and, and it's an attitude thing as well. Um, this environment we're in, um, acting positively with the regulator, engaging positively, um, is a really important perspective for the board to think about and, and act upon. Don't regard it as adversarial, look at it as supportive. And that means it'll be a win for everybody, um, yourselves, your members and the regulator. Um, you will have issues or most likely have issues from time to time that require discussion and interaction. Um, taking and starting that with a positive frame of mind um, is an absolutely essential um, outcome or ab absolutely essential process for, to get a good outcome. That's the first uh, element of um, behaviour that I want to touch on. And now I'm going to pass over to Brian to take you through some more. Um, so over to you, Brian. Thank you, Tim. So just moving on the same theme, we're going to look at diligence now. And, and this is about knowing your scheme. So what we're going to talk about here is a little bit about the documents for the scheme that will be important to you. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on the people around the table, although Tim has already mentioned uh, uh, that already. And then I'm going to touch on the people that provide services to you. And then finally, I'll finish this section by looking at board processes. So first of all, the important point is to know your scheme through your documentation. So every scheme will have a trustee. And that is your Bible. So it's very important that you have a copy of this and uh, that you understand what is in your trustee. Because this, this is going to set out how the scheme works. So the first question I would ask uh, is, is this a defined benefit scheme? And that's where members typically receive pensions for life. Or is it a defined contribution scheme where on leaving service members will receive lump sums? Next question I'll be asking is, is the scheme still open to new members? Because if it is, then that scheme is going to require a product disclosure statement, which we have we've referred to earlier. Generally, you'll find that schemes are, that are open to new members in this market are the, what they call the defined contribution schemes. So in other words, lump sums when you retire from service. Um, other documents that are important for you to be aware of is the statement of, of um, investment policy and objectives. Uh, this outlines actually your, your uh, investment policies. 
And the other document that you may well find too with your scheme, particularly if it's an open scheme, is what we call an other material information document. And this document provides additional information in support of the product disclosure statement. So these are the key documents, but where will you find them? Well, your administration manager should have a copy of those so you can get ready access. But uh, on the government website called Disclose is where you'll find all these documents and any updates to these documents. And at the same time, Disclose will also give you the last annual report as well as the audited financial information. But having said all that, uh, I have to confess that I find it very convenient to, to maintain my own files. Uh, I keep all those documents in my own records and I find that you know, very easy to access if I, if I need to refer to anything very quickly. Um, the one thing that we should just touch on briefly is the member board. Uh, Tim probably got a different experience on this than I have because I operate. It's common today to member it was, uh, if you go back 10, 20 years ago, where there were pension schemes or the defined benefit schemes, because the, the benefits that were available for those members were quite complex in terms of how you work those out, and particularly around the pensions and whether there were spouse pensions and all those sorts of issues. Uh, so the members booklet was quite an important document for members to actually to see in front of them, in plain English, just what exactly the, uh, the scheme would mean for them if they were a member. Um, the schemes that are primarily contribution, defined contribution schemes, usually are fairly straightforward, only have lump sum payments on leaving service, and generally I don't see too many uh, member booklets in, in those scenarios. So there are other documents that might also be important to your role as a trustee. Uh, most schemes have a professional administration manager and, or, and usually also professional secretarial services provider usually the same organisation, and if so, then there will be an administration services agreement. And that agreement is very important to you as a trustee, because that will outline all the services that are going to be provided, and usually a timeline. It's like a service level agreement, if you like. Uh, there are some businesses, some corporates that will provide those services to their schemes, and if so, then again, it's important to have a services level agreement with the sponsor if, that, if they are going to provide those services. There may be a custody agreement. Uh, this would be relevant if there was a nominee company custodian or if the assets were held by a specialist custodian. But if the uh, scheme actually is governed by a trustee that is a corporate, then there is no need to have such a document because the corporate themselves can hold the assets. And the other documents that might be important to you are fund management agreements. Um, from my experience, these are generally just application forms, uh, but there are some fund managers that do have quite a, a detailed funds management agreement. And if so, you know, you should have a copy of that in your Bible of documents. So next I want to touch on is who sits around the table and what role will they play in respect of the scheme. And Tim's already mentioned some of this already. So he's talked about the LIT, uh, an excellent source of information. So don't hesitate to ask any questions about any matter that's unclear to you. The other members of the board will usually be scheme members or pensioners or and, and or likely to be from the sponsoring company themselves representing their interests. Uh, Tim referred to in some cases other independent appointments. And yes, I have experienced that as well in a couple of my schemes. Um, but the smaller schemes generally have just pensioner members or scheme members and a sponsor members around the table, as well as your LIT. The larger schemes will probably have a number of board committees. Um, the smaller schemes generally have sort of what we call ad hoc subcommittees. And what happens in these cases is that if there is, say, the product disclosure statement needs updating or the SIPO needs updating, trustee needs updating, or the review of the financial information and the year-end report, then it's often common for the, uh, the trustees to appoint a subcommittee, if you like, to actually review those documents and then report back to the main board when those documents are in a reasonably suitable form for members to review. 
Uh, the important issue to think about here, though, is that notwithstanding the work that's done by the ad hoc committee, if you like, we subcommittee, you as an individual still have an obligation to be familiar with those documents and to approve those documents. So it doesn't get you out of you know, not reading those documents. So just getting to know then who the key advisors are that will be working with you as a board member. Um, I've already referred to the administration manager, uh, but you'll see them more than anybody else. They sit around the table, take the minutes and provide all the administrative services, including the payment of your pensions, the payment of uh, any benefits on leaving service, etc. Uh, there could be an independent custodian. We've referred briefly to that. Uh, the other important parties are the legal advisors to the scheme, and there will be um, many occasions when you'll need legal advice, so know who your legal advisors are. Auditors, you need the benefit of the auditors um, every year to sign off on the audited financial statements and the annual report, so know who your auditors are. And if there's life cover provided, uh, in most cases the life cover is restricted to schemes such as defined contribution schemes or defined benefit schemes where there are still members in service that haven't yet got to the point of taking on a pension. So if there is life cover provided, know who your life cover underwriter is. And that is a, it's a, becoming a smaller and smaller market, unfortunately. Uh, if the scheme is a defined benefit scheme, paying pensions and has pensioner liabilities, then there will also be an actuary. And again, very important to know who your actuary is. So turning now to my next slide on diligence, just gonna touch briefly on board policies. Um, these, of course, need to be very clear and unambiguous. And I actually think it's a really good idea to have all your policies in one place for easy reference. Most schemes I work with have a separate policy manual. Uh, one or two use an online depository scheme. It doesn't matter how you do it, but as long as you can go to one particular source document and there are all your policies out in front of you. Um, that it's just important to be able to refer to those from time to time for good governance. Uh, I don't believe that the policies need to be part of every meeting's papers, but they should definitely be reviewed regularly and certainly no more than annually. So just continuing on the theme of sort of uh, board policy, et cetera, member communications is quite an important issue. Um, the members themselves need confidence that their benefits will be paid out on time. So selling the story to members about what the trustees are doing or what the board is doing is a very important component for members. Some schemes I work with actually have uh, annual meetings of their members and now with the capabilities of being able to use Zoom, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, other schemes just use their annual report as the main source of information but then follow up with uh, newsletters from time to time, particularly when something dramatic might happen, like we've just had recently with COVID-19 and, and the uh, collapse in the financial markets and the volatility and everybody having to work from home. Uh, that, of course, I think a lot of members were very concerned, do I still going to get my pension payments made on time, etc.? So being able to send out uh, communications to your members to say, yes, everything is still on track and no change, um, there is a great deal of comfort from that, knowing that your trustees or your board are on top of issues um, as the year progresses. So something to think about. Uh, we've already talked briefly about using a member booklet, but not as common now as what it used to be. So now moving on to the next slide. The heading here is inquiry, preparation and commitment. And to me, um, this could be all summed up as commitment. Now, again, Tim has touched on quite a few of these points. But it, it is important to remember that the role of being a trustee is not without commitment. As a trustee, you've got obligations at law and you must act in members' best interests. So it's very important to make the time available to carry out your duties and responsibilities diligently. And this means appropriate preparation for meetings and adding to discussion over relevant issues. So as Tim mentioned, you've got to exercise your own independent judgment over issues. So listen carefully to any arguments that are put forward and put forward and also put forward your own views. 
But don't forget, take appropriate advice from the experts. They're there to help. It could be legal. It could be actuarial. It could be investment advice, whatever is um, being discussed at the time. But it is important that you have to make a decision on merit. Remember, you have to remember at all times that you're acting in members' best interests. Now, commitment also means self-improvement. So a good board member will seek opportunities to better understand their role and how they can add value to it. And there are a number of forums that will be useful uh, for, for the educational purposes along these lines. Uh, you, to mention, we, we've got two other um, forums going on with uh, the legal documents and also investments in this, in this series, and that is a good starting point. Fund managers actually provide regularly uh, investment seminars to, to members. Um, law firms also provide a number of seminars from time to time, which may be relevant. And the other thing is, too, don't hesitate to talk to your advisors and ask them to put on a specific uh, seminar, if you like, or a, uh, an hour or so of a meeting just dedicated to a particular topic that is of concern to you and your fellow board members. But the important thing is, if it's, if it's of concern to you, you can be certain that other members around the table will have the same concerns. So I want to talk next about the organisational and member awareness. So here we want to talk about the sponsor's position in respect of the scheme. Now, Tim mentioned earlier that you know, defined benefit schemes and the volatile financial markets may struggle to stay in surplus and it may be necessary to open discussions with your sponsor for a financial contribution. Certainly, it's important to keep in touch with the actuary and seek the actuary's advice about you know, the financial position of the scheme from time to time. Certainly, during COVID-19 period, we've probably spoken to our actuary and got reports at least three or four times a year in some cases. Um, at the very least, you'll find that sponsors will be meeting the administration expenses for your schemes, but generally there, are, you know, there will be times when the deficit is such that ongoing funding is required from the sponsor. And I think it's, it's important to remember that where there is a deficit, as a rule of thumb, the FMA would expect the trustee to work closely with the sponsor to ensure that any deficit is cleared within five years. Purely a, a rule of thumb. Uh, in some cases, the FMA may be happier with a slightly longer period, but uh, that's a discussion that you would need to have with the Financial Markets Authority. Uh, also important to keep in close touch with any corporate activity regarding the sponsor, particularly the sponsor, um, also your service providers, but particularly the sponsor because your, your sponsor is, is the long-term sponsor of your scheme. So you need to ensure that your members' interests are protected and that you understand exactly what any corporate activity involving the sponsor means as far as your members are concerned. And you certainly may need to take some legal advice around that. Um, I would also just add here, you know, we've talked about service providers, but um, you're not actually wedded to any particular service provider. Uh, it's generally appropriate to review the performance of your service advisors uh, at least every three years. Um, there will be times when you feel that the level of performance is not slightly up to scratch and it's very appropriate to sit down and have a conversation with them to get things back on track. Uh, if not, then certainly there will probably be other options in the market that you can look at. But nevertheless, as, as a board member, it is certainly your duty and one of your responsibilities to ensure that your service providers are delivering because your obligations as a trustee or as a board member uh, to monitor uh, the performance of that service provider. So just touching on quickly now, just the key risks. So I found that it's good governance and good practice to have a risks register. And th this is where you actually identify the various risks that could touch on your scheme. The register would identify the level of that risk, um, the factors that can mitigate those risks, uh, the likelihood of that risk happening, all those sorts of issues. Uh, again, I, I think the risk register is something that should be part of all your meeting papers because I think it's timely to remind ourselves of what those risks are and whether or not those risk mitigating factors are still appropriate. 
Uh, certainly, I would suggest that the risks are reviewed regularly and no often or no more often than six monthly. Um, just talking about the sort of the due diligence and the compliance oversight work for your scheme. We've talked about <clears throat> subcommittees that manage the due diligence process um, around your SIPA, et cetera, and the PDS and so on. But um, I think in terms of the, the key risks, it is important to have a very clear process, understand what that process is in terms of actually how you manage the important documents and the review of those documents. So, you know, when it comes to compliance itself, um, the oversight is generally handled by the administration manager, uh, but it is good governance to have as part of your board pack a compliance and activities calendar. And this will list all the key dates where actions are required to ensure that the scheme will remain compliant and doesn't breach any obligations at law. Um, and therefore, you've got something that you can actually monitor at each meeting in terms of ensuring that all the various activities that are required have been carried out successfully. So um, again, it's something I keep my own diary in terms of those, those key dates, but probably not necessary to go that far as long as uh, you've got something in your board papers to indicate uh, what has happened in the last quarter since the last meeting and what should be happening in the next quarter. They're the key dates to take into consideration. And moving now to the, uh, the next slide, which is protection for trustees and directors. So the protection is important to you as a board member. So you need to understand uh, what indemnities are available to you under the, the terms of the trustee and by law. Now, if you're unclear on this, um, just ask your legal advisors to spell this out for you. Generally, in, within the trustee, you'll be indemnified um, to the extent not limited by the Financial Markets Conduct Act, and also, of course, provided that you haven't acted negligently. But notwithstanding those protections, every scheme should also carry its own professional indemnity cover or directors and officer cover or a combination of both. Um, sometimes this is actually organised as part of the sponsors' insurance programs, uh, or sometimes if the uh, other members of the board are primarily representatives of the sponsor, then the sponsor may undertake to protect uh, those employee board members. But of course, that leaves the gap when it comes to the licensed independent trustee or any other in, um, independent individual. So those individuals will have to make sure that they carry their own cover. Um, it is Generally, the case, though, that most schemes will actually have a separate cover. And if this is the case, then or it doesn't really matter who carries the cover as long as you understand what actually is in the policy. So make sure for the first up that you get a full copy of that policy so you understand what is covered and what where the gaps are, if any. Um, on an annual basis, there's no need, I think, to get another copy of the policy because generally the terms and conditions of the policy won't change. But I think it's good practice to get a copy of what we call the certificate of currency, which is the confirmation of the renewal for a further 12 month period. Remember with PI cover, DNO cover, it is a 12 month by 12 month story. So the fact that you sign up to a PI cover, DNO cover, doesn't mean to say it's there for as long as you want the cover. You have to sign up for it every year and you have to make certain representations that you're not aware of any claims or anything along those lines um, under the past policies, et cetera. But I, it, nevertheless, it is an important piece to have to give you some peace of mind. And just lastly, I would like to finish off with a uh, sort of touching on some of the elements of ineffective governance. So I guess uh, Tim has again covered some of these points just very briefly. So I'll just go through a couple of points here. So I guess you know, it keeps coming back to the fact for me that you're acting for members and a member's best interests. And even though you might have a personal interest in the scheme, either as a member or as a sponsor's representative, you need to put that aside when you're carrying out your duties and responsibilities as a board member, because you know, your obligation is to ensure that all members are treated equitably. And that means putting aside any biases that you might have. Now, look, we all understand, you know, time, times are busy. 
very hard sometimes to devote appropriate time to the role of the trustee. But if you've accepted the appointment, you've got an obligation to carry out your duties and responsibilities to the best of your ability. So that means you've got to make time for the role. Um, as Tim's mentioned briefly, it is very easy just to go with the flow. Um, but again, it's important to be active rather than a passive member of the board. It's important to contribute. You're there for a reason. And it is important that you do contribute and get across your point of view. Uh, a trap for some boards, there is sometimes more, it's easy to focus on the small stuff and avoid the important issues. Um, to me, the important issues are vital for members' best interests. And in that sense, look, don't be afraid to take professional advice if it's going to help you get to a decision. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I mean, you have to make a decision on merit, but don't hesitate to take advice. And I think I'll finish there. Uh, this, this will bring us to the end of part one of governance. Um, and if you do have any questions regarding the material in this presentation or your duties and responsibilities in general, then look, you're most welcome to contact Tim or myself and our uh, email address was at the beginning of this presentation. We might not be able to give you a direct answer, but we should be able to certainly point you in the right direction. And we've also mentioned throughout this presentation, your lit, I mean, they will be a source of a lot of information and may also be able to help you with anything that is of concern to you. So this completes part one. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there is part two, which was the topic um, around behaviours and conduct of trustees and board members and how they should be working together. And we hope you can actually join us for part two. So thank you.